We finished the previous lesson by looking at the abdication of the Tsar, uh, of Tsar Nicholas II. And we focused on the February Revolution and we looked at how the February Revolution leads to the abdication of, of, of Tsar, Nicholas, Tsar Nicholas II. Now, there's a period which could be described something of an interim period between the February Revolution and the revolution that takes place in October. And this is a period that is exemplified by the establishment of the provisional government. Now, the provisional government will ultimately collapse, and we'll explain why this is the case. And we will see the eventual uh, rise of the, the, the Bolsheviks uh, and, the, uh, and the establishment of the Soviet Union. But we'll have to get to that in a, in a few lessons time. So like I said, the previous lesson examined the February Revolution as well as the abdication of Tsar Nicholas II. This event in March created essentially a power vacuum. And where there is ever a power vacuum that takes place, the question is how is this power vacuum going to be filled? And so with the collapse of the Romanov dynasty, with the collapse of autocracy in Russia, we have to think about what actually happens afterwards that leads to the filling of this power vacuum. And don't forget as well, we are still at war. This is still, we have still have the First World War that is going on, um, despite the fact that it is all going very, very poorly for the Russian Empire. So this is the lesson that is going to essentially explain the establishment of the provisional government at the end of the abdication, following the end of the abdication of, uh, of Nicholas II. So we know already that the February Revolution causes the end of the Romanov dynasty. And despite this, it was not able to establish a new legitimate form of government. This is arguably more important than the abdication of the Tsar himself, because without the establishment of, of legitimacy and justification of a new government, then we have potentially anarchy and further revolutionary action that takes place. Rather paradoxically, the February Revolution instead establishes a system of dual power. This dual power was shared between two major governing bodies. We have on the one hand the Petrograd Soviet, and then on the other hand we have the establishment of the provisional government. Now beginning first with the provisional government, the power of the provisional government came from the fact that it was drawn out of the state Duma. The state Duma still existed and still had existed uh, since the October Manifesto and the, and the establishment of the state Duma uh, in 1905-1906. And the State Duma had made numerous calls for the removal of the uh, of Nicholas from power, or at least the restriction of Nicholas's power. And as time went on, things became more and more desperate. The provisional government was somewhat legitimate, owing to the fact that it came from the State Duma. But the provisional government was recognised as only being provisional. It was only recognised as being a temporary stopgap before the establishment of a more formal system of governance could be established. The aim was to draw a new constitution for the prime minister and the uh, of the provisional government. Um, we have uh, Prince L V uh, G E sorry Lvov, and essentially the the aim is to um, establish a more formal codified constitutional setup that is able to um, weather the storm that would be the end of the first world war the subsequent treaty of brest litovsk which we'll get to in future lessons and to establish stability within the russian state and not see it devolve into any kind of extremist uh, ideological um, st uh, systems which we will get to as well when we look at the october revolution the rest of the uh, government was made up of leading liberals with uh, the cadets, and during the time of the dual power, uh, the dual power within the this system between February and October, the dual power of the provisional government and the Petrograd Soviet, we see a number of important players. So we've got the prime minister of the provisional government being uh, Prince Lvov, but we also see the uh, the the individual by the name of Alexander Kerensky being very important in this point as well because what Kerensky was able to do was to help the two institutions work together since he was a member of both the provisional government and a member of the Petrograd Soviet in fact Alexander Kerensky was so seminal in terms of his importance towards the uh, maintenance of some level of stability during this period 
um, that I arguably without his um, without his role being played, we might not have had a provisional government for as long as we did, which was only a few months, but still uh, a particular feat of achievement. The Petrograd Soviet, on the other hand, represented the working people and the soldiers of Petrograd. It had one real main aim. It wanted to defend the rights of workers. Now, ultimately, it was directly elected by the workers of Petrograd, and elections would take place regularly to ensure worker representation. So, owing to the fact that there was a different structure with the Petrograd Soviet versus the provisional government, and owing also to the fact that both had different aims, the provisional government aimed to establish a new constitutional set, uh, settlement and to formally uh, create a new... Uh, legitimate source of authority to fill the power vacuum that was left by Nicholas II, whereas the Petrograd Soviet had only one real aim, which was to defend the rights of workers. It meant that the idea of these two groups working together was potentially very, very difficult and fraught with a number of challenges. What was more challenging is the fact that it was seen as more powerful than the provisional government which is problematic given the fact that the provisional government had the aim to try and establish a legitimate form of governance to fill the power vacuum that was left by Nicholas, whereas the Petrograd Soviet wanted to defend the rights of workers. So we have a problem here because arguably the more legitimate goal, the more legitimate task would be to try and fill the power vacuum, the, the goals of the provisional government and to try to establish a new constitution. So the fact that this was in the hands of the least powerful institution was quite problematic. We also have the fact that the Petrograd Soviet was more powerful owing to the practical control that the Petrograd Soviet had over the features of everyday life within the state. It was mainly because of the fact that the Soviets controlled the local garrisons, they controlled factories, they controlled railways, and they were the greatest representation for the workers. The, uh, the Soviet itself was established during the February Revolution of 1917. I also want to make clear that we have also a further in instance of, uh, of interesting institutions, which is that of the St. Petersburg Soviet of 1905. Um, and essentially, the way in which we can understand the Petrograd Soviet is to think about how it related to or was likened to the similarities of the St. Petersburg Soviet of 1905. So there were a number of similarities and differences between these two institutions. On the one hand, they were both directly elected by factory workers and soldiers. Uh, they also held elections at a very regular pace, uh, on regular basis, owing to the fact that they wanted to see, uh, they wanted to ensure that there was a, a great amount of worker representation during and throughout the whole entire period of their, uh, of their existence. Delegates also both received the same pay as ordinary workers, again to ensure that there was no hierarchy that existed between the two groups of individuals. There were some differences, however, of course. So in 1905, intellectuals who were the members of the radical parties were allowed to advise the Soviet. Um, this was something that was not allowed uh, in 1917, since the Petrograd Soviet allowed them to become full members. So if anything, it was actually worse. Um, rather than the St. Petersburg Soviet, which was essentially attempting to be uh, by the people, for the people, for the workers specifically, uh, elected by workers, uh, owned by workers, represented by workers, and only would be advised by intellectuals. In fact, the Petrograd Soviet actually did allow uh, intellectuals to become full members. So this period is known as the period of dual power. We have the provisional government on the one hand, and we have the Petrograd Soviet on the other. It had a number of problems, did the provisional government. This was mainly owing to the fact that it had a policy of revolutionary def uh, def defeatism, defendism. Sorry. Um, this was a policy of essentially um, uh, trying to continue the First World War for the purpose of defending the revolution, to maintain the revolution at home. Now, this is very problematic. Because essentially one of the main reasons why the Tsar abdicated in the first place was because of the First World War. So if you're going to make the decision to continue the First World War, then you're going to face the same problems that was faced by the Tsar himself. And so you're going to be presented with the same critiques and you're going to have the same challenges. 
e.g. workers wanting higher pay and wanting less hours. We have the introduction of rations that was being brought in, uh, which caused the February Revolution in the first place. And we also have the fact that peasants wanting uh, the land that they worked on. All of these things were problems that were not being faced and not being solved by the provisional government and the dual power structure because of the fact that they wanted to continue the First World War. Given also the fact that the authority of the government itself was limited, owing to the fact that it was A, not as powerful as the Petrograd Soviet, and B, not actually supposed to be a permanent structure, it was supposed to be provisional, temporary, it meant that their decision to continue the First World War meant that they were essentially uh, continuing a very unpopular policy that was going to directly negatively impact the majority of the population of the Russian state, and they didn't, and they weren't seen, sorry, as legitimate in making that decision.